again, just to, to repeat the, the question, uh, what do you see as sort of the root causes at work here, creating all of these different uh, struggles that we, we organize around? Thanks, Marisol. Uh, I'm Woody Sanders. I teach at UTSA. What I'd like to do is take a couple of minutes to talk about here uh, and some of our history, uh, in part that I get to learn and relearn as I try and work on a book on San Antonio uh, this summer and in the coming months. These are not new issues. Um, when the Federal Urban Renewal Program started uh, here in the mid-1950s, the first place San Antonio's uh, elected officials and city staff looked at as a place to try and improve a neighborhood and reshape the city's serious housing problems was in Edgewood, uh, which had kind of blossomed during and immediately after the Second World War. Uh, at a time when the city never bothered with housing codes. It's not entirely clear they do today either, but at least then they didn't at all. Um, they didn't bother putting in basic infrastructure like streets and sidewalks and often didn't much bother with sewers either. Um, and so Edgewood was the focus and the, the city did a series of studies and said we're going to tackle that. And then lo and behold, three years later, the needs of the Edgewood area and indeed the whole larger west side neatly evaporated. Uh, and the, the city's urban renewal board and its planners very quickly focused on what they called the central west area. Uh, the area just west of San Pedro Creek uh, and City Hall and the county courthouse. Uh, an area that had once been home to our renowned red light district. And they said, we're going to bulldoze that. We're going to move everybody out of there. We're going to tear it all down. Uh, and we're going to replace it with new light industrial buildings and cheap hotels. Uh, and they did that. The answer to the housing and neighborhood needs here in the 1950s was to get rid of the poor people who live next door to downtown. Uh, and then they sold that land to folks like Morris Callison uh, and Red McCombs, who graced us with things like La Quinta hotels uh, and office buildings and warehouses, uh, some of which now house the, the city's archives and the uh, Mayor Castro's Cafe College program. They didn't build a very interesting urban environment when they got rid of folks. And they did very much the same thing on the site of Hemisphere. Uh, they moved out hundreds of people who lived there. Uh, now we find ourselves in a situation where folks here in those same jobs and circumstances are saying what we need is housing downtown. <laughs> and what we need to do is provide incentives and a whole raft of public mechanisms and a great deal of money to make new housing happen. You know, and here's this curious phenomenon. We had housing downtown. We had lots of housing downtown. And I remember when I first moved here in 1982, how thriving the west side of downtown, of El Centro, was uh, with Solo Serve and La Feria, uh, and a host of stores I trust many of you remember and that you need to educate your kids and grandkids about as well. We had a thriving downtown. What we've done in the years since is implement and sustain a set of policies that have made it cheap and easy to move out and have substantially ignored our inner city until the point at which now we find that many of the same kinds of folks who participated in getting that cheap land that the city had cleared in the 1950s, many of those same kinds of folks seek to profit, seek to take advantage of this new set of policies. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate about whether this is displacement or gentrification or whether this is or should be a decade of downtown. But let me make a couple of things clear. As, as briefly as a professor can manage, okay? First, 
we've never, as a community, paid attention, the kind of attention we need to, to building strong, healthy neighborhoods. We simply never have done that, which means we've found ourselves 30 and 40 and 50 years later spending money to fix the drainage problems and the lack of sidewalks and the lack of good quality infrastructure and education in much of our inner city. Second, that all too often what we've done is say we want development. And that gives folks who have money an opportunity to say, we'll do something for you. We'll give you some gift. Okay? And those gifts don't always work. You know, I teach on UTSA's downtown campus, and some of you may remember that there were houses there before, and after the houses came Mayor Henry Cisneros' grand vision of a festival marketplace anchoring a revitalized West Side, and I remember sitting at a table with Henry Cisneros when he talked about his vision of West Side welfare mothers manufacturing computers on Frio Street. You seen anybody making computers on Frio Street in a long time? We miss that, okay? And part of the problem here is that when we quest for, incentivize, indeed lust for the wonders of development, what we get is something that may work for a few people or for a little while, but doesn't make this a better, more substantial place to live or get a job or raise a family. So what we need to do when we talk about these issues is put them in, I would argue, a much larger context. And that's a context in which we put families, and people, and neighborhoods, and a healthy, sustaining, fruitful quality of life first, and worry about taking care of folks who want to make a lot of money out of cheap land and public incentives a little further down the list. Thanks.